growing up in my colonized education in England, I was led to believe that black people did not resist, that black people accepted slavery, that they accepted colonialism, that they accepted the imposed inferiority. We also have a history, a history of resistance, not just a history of being victims, but the history of organizing ourselves. Enslaved people or colonized people uh, liberated themselves. They fight for, this, for themselves. So I've been motivated and reassured against the colonized education to recognize for every act of oppression, there's an act of resistance. I think one of the best story of resistance, there have been many, is the story of the Aztec Emperor Quetumoc. He was defeated in a war with the Spaniards and he was captured. Uh, he makes what is known as his last great man, his last message to the people. And he realized the significance of that when he said, Our sun has gone down, our sun has been lost from view and has left us in complete darkness. The most interesting aspect of Quahatumak's speech was the contrast between the enlightenment in Europe. So the enlightenment was about modernity, about progress, about knowledge and science. And Quahatumak's speech says, no, that era which you call enlightenment is in fact the darkness for the colonized people. So he knew that it was not just the son of the people in, in Mexico where he was situated, but of the civilization which he represented. And he knew that the civilization would endure a long period of oppression and repression. Let's join together, let's embrace each other, and in the very center of our being, hide all that our hearts love and we know is a great treasure. Let us hide our temples, our schools, our sacred soccer game, our youth centers, our houses of flowery song, so that only our streets remain. Our homes will enclose us until our new sun rises. He makes us call to the people to, to take these teachings and in a sense, put them in your home, meaning keep them in your private space. The values, your knowledge, your ideas, which will be infected by colonialism, try to keep them intact. He makes a specific mention to both mothers and fathers, do not forget to teach these things to your children. Most honorable fathers and most honorable mothers, may you never forget to guide your young ones. Teach your children while you live how good it has been and will be. Use the family and the community as institutions for keeping this knowledge and values intact and pass it through to the other generations. The resistance was in the fact that he said, but one day the sun will rise again. So his message was, however hard and long the oppression will take, there will be a new moment for a new world civilization to rise. And he's recognizing that in this current context, we can't fight in, in the ways that we've been used to. We can't go head on. We're being slaughtered. So what we must do is make sure that we 
to do at minimum the best to preserve a sense of who we are for we know that this is going to be a long struggle that's going to be fought in different ways and i think that's also the case at the present time look around Europe, I see constant, persistent, organized and deliberate resistance. So we resist the target system, the system of oppression. We resist the oppression of the white power structured establishment. The oppression of and, ex and exploitation of uh, non-white people. It's basically racism, systematic racism, racism from the institutions. And demonization of the human. We're fighting a world civilization of death. When we talk about a civilization of death and destruction, it's not just physical death, it's not just killing people, but it's trying to break the spirit, it's trying to break all that, that makes us who we are as, as people. And when we say we, we are talking about a political group. And this political group is um, composed of black people from Africa, from the West Indies, from uh, um, and Arab and Muslim people, it could be Asian people, it could be um, Roma people, people who are suffering from what we call state racism. And we are in the era in decolonizing the mind that analyzes the mechanisms of how darkness was created. And uh, so we know how to fight the enlightenment of the white. Systems of racism as ideological systems, as belief systems, were dominated by Europeans who always put themselves at the top of this hierarchy and always put people of color in general and black people in particular at the bottom. That system came into being with colonialism. It didn't exist before. And one of the important things about racism is to absolutely recognize that racism began and was developed and was elaborated in Europe. Because what the European colonial expansion did was to destroy all the other civilizations in the world and impose this one. So 1492 is historically a very important date because then the Spaniards, Christians, defeated the Muslims rulers of the southern of Spain uh, with Cordoba and especially Granada. The European colonial expansion began in Granada, in the conquest of Granada. When the uh, Spanish crown won the war against uh, uh, the Islamic rulers and they took over Alhambra, the castle uh, of uh, uh, the Muslim rulers, there they realized now they have the power but needed also more money to reach a wider war of conquest. That was the main thing because Europe did not produce anything at the time. Europe was a very, very underdeveloped, obscurantist uh, place in the world. Columbus has been lobbying for years uh, in Portugal, uh, uh, in, in Spain, to get funding for his so-called journey to, to India. Uh, however, the Queen uh, very specifically said, first 
we handle business here in Granada and then after we, we win then you could uh, get authorization to sell uh, sell west. People think that these are accidental things, they were, were not. Columbus met with the king and the queen a year, a year and a half before the, the, the final fall of Granada. And when they took Granada over from uh, the Muslim rulers, then the door was open for Columbus. There is a, a statue here in Granada where you can see Columbus on his knees giving the enterprise of the Indies document and that is that's in January 11, 1492, nine days after the fall of Granada. So uh, the fall of Granada, the castle of Alhambra uh, was the end of an era where the Muslim rulers in fact had a multicultural society there. We have Muslims, Christians and Jews living, co coexisting. And now the door was open to uh, go to a conquest that would impose Christian theology and one state and one nation in all other parts of the world. The pretension of having one state, one identity, one people in one territory, you know, and the identity of all of that becoming one to one. Well, that became secularized later into the concept of nation state. So, uh, uh, basically, with the fall of Granada, diversity made a way for university. When the Spaniards occupied the land of the indigenous people of the Americas, they killed them at a very high rate. They were tortured, uh, the indigenous people were required to work as slaves in the gold mines and the plantations that the Spanish were setting up. They died in massive numbers. That's when the king of Spain puts the, the case, you know, for a debate in a trial. And the scientists of those times were theologians, because we're talking about 1550 when the debate of Valladolid took place. And this was debated between uh, Gine Sepulveda and Bartolomé de las Casas. And they were debating uh, uh, the methods of the conquest. So in that period, the so-called scientists of that time argued, can we wage war and enslave the indigenous people? The concern was if the methods of the conquest were correct in the eyes of God or not. Sepulveda argued that you can wage war and enslave the indigenous people of the Americas because they are not Christians, they are barbarians. For him, because they're just animals. It's like a cow or a horse or any other animal you put in the process of labor production and it's not a thing in the eyes of God. And uh, Las Casas said, no, you should treat them like human being. But Las Casas saw the indigenous people not as normal human being. He saw them as children with less intellectual capacity and so they need to be Christianized. Barbarians to be Christianized was the slogan of Las Casas. So these were two white men debating whether to occupy another man's land. Las Casas won the trial. So Las Casas was the white savior of that time. What the indigenous people of that time thought was not part of the debate. At the end of the day, the decline of the indigenous population due to the horrors of colonialism uh, poses the problem of how do you get labor for the plantations uh, in uh, the Americas. And Las Casas then proposed to uh, kidnap, to bring them from Africa. So the whole system of transatlantic enslavement was on the advice of Las Casas. From 1650 onwards, in the 17th century, going into the 17th century, the Spaniards then get competitors, which are the Dutch, the French, and the English. So you have a small group of Western nations who basically did the colonization of the world. To organize a world into a superior and inferior part, you need power. You need institutions that forces the other part to become inferior. 
and enforces the superiority, so-called superiority, of the colonizer on the colonized. The first dimension of colonialism is economics, where wealth created in the colonized world was transferred to the colonizer's world. The second was political, where the colonizer instituted an administration in the colony, run by white people from the colony. The third was social, where social relations were organized on the base of race and ethnicity, white on the top, uh, black and brown on, on the bottom. The fourth was culture, where a new form of knowledge production came into being, where university and universalism and exclusive Western knowledge was seen as superior. The enslavement of the mind, mental slavery, the colonization of the mind. And that is so deep that you accept nonsense as common sense. When somebody goes into a shop and steals a bottle of milk, you call him normally a criminal. But when Columbus goes and steals gold of the indigenous people, they call the discoverer. And then the fifth is geographical, where a new world civilization came into being. It was not regional anymore, like the Ottomans, or like uh, the Greeks, or uh, like the Chinese. It was not regional. When the transatlantic enslavement and the plantation system in the Americas created this global world economy with shipping and banking and the industries based on the uh, uh, products of the colonies, cotton, sugar, etc. created this world economy. Then they moved on to other parts of the world in Asia, the Middle East and India where uh, 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 new eras of exploitation came to the fore. So you see the colonization of India uh, uh, and, and, and the rest of uh, uh, Asia taking place in the 19th century. It was global now, connecting every part of the world in one global economic, social, political and cultural system. The legacy of colonialism is racism. A limited view of racism is where you see racism as an individual emotional relations, where white people treat people of color uh, uh, in a bad way. You have to understand where it comes from. Where does that behavior come from? What institutions have created this mind of racism? And that is a different ball game. It's a system of human classification which divides the population of the world into supposedly distinctive races and argues that some races are superior and some races are inferior. The criteria to make people inferior are different. It can be the skin, it can be the nationality, it can be religion. From 1492 till 1650, more or less, Theological racism was paramount, which means that the argument for superiority inferiority was based on religion. Barbaric, non-Christians were inferior people. Then from 1650 onwards until 1850, you get the European Enlightenment with philosophers with European regard as great philosophers, Hegel, Kant, Hume, uh, Rousseau, Voltaire, Montesquieu, you name them all. Elite white men creating, elaborating and disseminating racist ideas. These people were seen as the highlight 
of intellectual development in Europe. And they created a, a racist philosophy based on biology. In that period, superiority and inferiority began to be defined in terms of race and color. So biology became the distinctive feature in disting uh, distinguishing between superior and inferior creatures. And then from 1815, after the abolition of slavery and the rise of the social sciences with sociology, anthropology, uh, you get an argument that uh, defies human being in advanced cultures, modern cultures, and backward cultures. So the Western cultures was the superior advanced cultures and the non-Western cultures were the backward inferior culture. So these forms, this transition uh, of one form of racism to another form of racism was connected to how knowledge developed. Uh, in the first period from 1500 to 1650, the authority of knowledge was theology. So superiority and inferiority was argued from theology. From 1650 to 1850, philosophy and natural science and biology were the authority of knowledge and they argued uh, racism from biology. And with the rise of the social science from 1850 onward, inferiority was argued from culture. Non-Western cultures were inferior and Western culture was superior. So which until today we see in Islamophobia where Islam is seen as an inferior culture. All of this led to a world where you have some people consider superior above the line of the human, so people consider inferior below the line of the human. The rights which holds for uh, white people in these countries are not being held for people of color. Democracy does not look the same as the people for in La La Land. It must be nice living in La La Land, a celebration of the European man, a paradise, a never ending wonderland. Sets the tone, the white savior, undeniable hero, and you're the center of the world, and you're in control of La La Land. And when you kill, it's an honest mistake. Forgiven, forgotten, it's done. And when you lie, you don't discriminate. Cause you are the rational one. direct colonial administrations, except in a few places around the world, like the island I'm coming from, Puerto Rico or Palestine. Um, the reality is that we're still living in a colonial world. When the Europeans conquered other parts of the world, they created that I this idea of the nation state. That is that in one state, there lives one nation, one people with one language one culture, etc. The Netherlands is a nation state where people talk Dutch and they have the values of the Dutch. But when they colonize other parts of the world, these parts of the world had other languages, other people, other values, were not acknowledged as being part of humans. And usually what happened that those identities, those people who are identified in certain ways, uh, different from the mainstream identity of a nation state, then they are excluded. And in different uh, countries, you see now political organizations uh, like the Parti des Indigenes de la République uh, in, in France, of the political party uh, DENC, which is uh, represented in Parliament here. 
the political parties demand that their identities uh, become part of this nation state which is not con doesn't consist of one nation only and the nation state is racist because of the of the no of the notion of nation who belongs to the nation this is what Uh, is important to know if we want to know who is benefiting from racism. Vaak is, zijn dat grijze oude witte mannen uh, die uh, voor zichzelf hebben bepaald van dit is de norm en alles wat daarvan afwijkt, ja dat, dat is eigenlijk uh, krijgt niet altijd dezelfde kansen. And the nation state is now uh, facing a crisis and that is the crisis of diversity because Once you have a state where have people of color with other religion, other languages, other values, etc., what kind of state are you building then? So the whole idea of questioning Dutch colonial legacy has to do with questioning Dutch identity. So take the celebration of uh, uh, Santa Claus where people give presents and the emotions of, of, of love and solidarity uh, is entangled in, in uh, a system where you have this character, this racist character of black people. Swarte Piet is basically white people in blackface where they, they uh, say that Swarte Piet becomes black because he came from a chimney, but that doesn't explain why Swarte Piet has Afro wig Uh, why you have uh, gold earrings, red lipstick. And they present that as if it's a harmless cultural tradition when in fact it's deeply offensive, it's absolutely tied to caricatures of slavery. And you would have Sinterklaas who is this white old man on a horse and then he has like hundreds of servants and these servants are basically white people in blackface. It's a dehumanizing character of the African that is being portrayed as a slave, as a dumb people uh, uh, with the sole purpose is to make the white person happy. So there is no way to, to turn away from Schwarte Piet. And it's because it's uh, fully institutionalized. From, from primary school, you are basically, I would say for children of color, we are forced to celebrate this tradition. Another example of the distorted Uh, identity of the Dutch uh, in dealing with the colonial history is how they deal with the independence date of Indonesia. The Dutch occupied Indonesia for three centuries. Sukarno, uh, die heeft dus de proclamatie uitgeroepen, 17 augustus 1945. You would expect the Dutch to respect that. Maar dat Nederland dat ons niet wil erkennen is dat natuurlijk heel logisch. Als ze dat erkennen, dat betekent dat Nederland een soevereine staat heeft aangevallen. Dat die vier jaar lang uh, uh, zeg maar die oorlog heeft gevoerd, waar ze dus 200.000 mensen hebben gestuurd. De Dutch, after the liberation from the Nazis, instituted the same system that the Nazis put in occupying Holland, they used in Indonesia, without feeling any guilt that it that it was wrong. At the end of the day, they had negotiations with the Indonesians uh, that ended in an agreement uh, in December 1949. And the Dutch used that as their date. Dit is Nederlands geschiedenis, hè? Zo praten ze. Uh, wij zijn niet erkend, ze erkennen 27 december 1949. Ja, de soevereinheid overdracht. Oké. Okay. Als wij daarvan uitgaan, dat betekent dat, dat tot en met die datum. Nederlands onderdanen die daar allemaal wonen. Of, of zie, ik dat, zie ik dat verkeerd? Met andere woorden, Nederland hebben, hebben een eigen burgers vermoord. Western nations, Western universities, Western schools try to persuade us that they are telling a story, a narrative that is objective, impartial, scientific. And yet we know for a fact that this is entirely untrue. I remember in high school when I had history and um, the topic of the Palestinian question came up very briefly and the teacher called the Palestinian soap bubbles um, in reference to uh, that they always blow themselves up, which was so dehumanizing and so um, 
so humiliating also, you know, knowing everything that is happening to them. They have experienced a form of genocide that continues to unfold, uh, of attempting to do a complete erasure of the history, culture, society, as well as uh, the actual presence of the Palestinians. With the Zionist movement that uh, is born in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Zionism is a philosophy that justifies the occupation of Palestinian land by Jewish people. They don't represent all Jewish people, but Zionism then used the horrors of the Jewish Holocaust as a justification to occupy Palestinian land. People from all over the world came there to claim it as their homeland, while people who were already living there were, you know, were banished. And that's why Palestine is so important in the decolonial movement. Like South Africa was in the 19th, the fight against apartheid in South Africa. In the coming decades, the fight against apartheid uh, and Zionism in Palestine will be the pinnacle of, of uh, the struggle against injustice. There's a huge gap in between uh, what I think, uh, if you start to teach that decolonial kind of narrative of the history and what is actually being taught in schools right now. And for several hundred years, the nations of Western Europe have told a story that aggrandizes themselves, that makes themselves look good, that portrays colonialism as a good thing that brought civilization, that brought Christianity, that brought culture to people who were supposedly inferior. It is not just like you telling me a story. It is about the state organizing a narrative. So through the educational system, we are forced to forget the resistance that have been going on for five centuries. We don't know the names of the leaders. We don't know the events. We don't know how they did it. Because if we did, it would strengthen our resistance and our resolve to resist. So, amnesia is about erasing the memory of resistance and replacing it by the fantasy of the lies of colonialism. You create lies by using five techniques. The first technique is using a terminology that covers up the truth. As ons land is 350 years uh... Bezet is, ik noem dat een bezetting. We noemen dat een kolonialisatie. We can say the same thing, of course, for Israel and Palestine. Go to any Arab country. We always call it a Philistine al muhtalla the, you know, the occupied Palestine. In every European nation, you have this concept of the golden era. The Dutch have also the golden age, which is for them the 17th century, where they looted as bandits, the richness of Indonesia and of the Caribbeans. The narrative around uh, the colonialism of the Dutch is that it was an enterprise, it was well intended. They have no shame in uh, masking uh, the banditism behind entrepreneurship. So they use the term entrepreneur to disguise a crime. The VOC, bijvoorbeeld, uh, the multinational. But that is the grofste verschilling van de mensenrechten. The second is, you don't use all the facts. You, you, you use only some facts to distort the world. When slavery was legally abolished in the Dutch Empire or the Kingdom of the Netherlands in the 1860s, the so-called master enslavers received a certain amount of money for each of the human people that they owned. Why did not? The enslaved receive money who would become legally free. Bovendien is het ook nog zo dat 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 wij uh, Indonesië op een gegeven moment uh, tijdens die onderhandelingen uh, de ronde tafel conferentie hebben 4,5 miljard gulden schadevergoeding moeten betalen aan Nederland 
Waar halen ze dat in dat hoofd? Pieter Sokoen die heeft een hele eiland banden. Heeft hij gewoon vermoord, alleen maar voor de Notre Moskaan. Denial of the existence of the indigenous population uh, itself. Uh, we saw this in the Americas, we see it this in Palestine. Uh, many of the Zionists says there is no such thing as Palestinian. Look at our education systems. All of science and history uh, is kind of permeated by the idea that everything is just from Europe. And it's, you know, there's nothing else in the world. There's no contribution. Then the third is you create a narrative of lies. And the narrative has general elements across the nations. But in each nation, there's a particular kind of emphasis. So in the United Kingdom, my country, the emphasis is on abolition and the wonderful philanthropic abolitionists. In France, the emphasis is on égalité, fraternité, liberté. In the Netherlands, the emphasis is on denying that they were ever involved in a big way. And in Spain and Portugal, their narrative is dominated by an idea which is actually quite pathetic and insulting. The idea is something called benevolent colonialism, that colonialism was in some way beneficial. So maybe there were some bad parts, but really that a foreground how Europe brought civilization to all these parts of the world. It doesn't matter whatever else happened. The murders, the genocide, the destruction of culture and, and so on and so forth. I mean, I, I shouldn't be laughing, but it is a fact that, you know, it's framed in this way that, you know, we brought you technology. You know, it was a good thing. And they did not feel that there was any need to kind of apologize or anything of that type for um, the rape, pillage, stealing and all that kind of stuff that goes along with colonialism. It, it like net of the vanzelfsprekend is. Dat vaak hoor je van, ah, oh, dat is lang geleden. Je moet de tijdgeest kijken. Uh, dat soort onzin. In Zuid-Afrika, de narrative was, white people without land, coming to Africa, where there was land but no people. The same narrative is used in Palestine by Zionism. That Palestine was a place where the Jews without land took the land where there were no people. So, a uh, uh, land without people for people without land. You put this narrative into a greater theory, which is the rise of civilization. In which black people are presented as coming from countries that are desperate, that are characterized by famine, that are characterized by dictators, that are characterized by inequality. Whereas Europe is presented as decent, Christian, advanced, civilized, and they present black people as having been brought here to escape from this desolation. And the last part of creating lies is that you leave ethics out of the story. You don't talk about good or bad anymore. It's true or false. Has Columbus found a new way to India? That is the story, not has Columbus committed genocide, because that is about ethics. Can you commit genocide?
So you produce a lie in a very sophisticated way. It would be impossible to have a Hitler street in Holland, a statue of Goebbels or Hitler in Amsterdam, because people know what a crime is against humanity and won't accept that. And mental slavery is about accepting those lies and decolonizing the mind is about attacking these lies. The true debate is about um, the consequences of colonialism. And, and we've been uh, sounding the alarms, if you will, to Europe to recognize for itself how it continues to delude itself. So the first thing is to recognize that the narrative is incomplete. Yeah, we don't speak about slavery. We don't speak about, in general, about the colonial past. They say black people have come to Europe because Europe is civilized, Christian, advanced. We are not here to speak about ourselves. That is the truth. With thanks to the colonialism and the slavery. Black people are in Europe because Europe was in Africa. Black people are in Europe because Europe was in the Americas and kidnapped and transported millions of Africans to the Americas. We are part of French history, uh, not because we wanted it, but because we had no choice. It is very painful omdat je ziet natuurlijk dat de, dat de Nederlandse uh, samenleving dat totaal niet, niet weten. This is why very often I'm not speaking about people with an immigrant background, but people with a colonial background. So what I say to people when they say, why are you here? I say, we are here because you were there. We hebben het inmiddels over een groep mensen die hier is geboren en getogen en nog steeds wordt aangeduid als de buitenlanders autochtoon of de vreemdeling. So historical narrative becomes a way not only to shape the past, but actually to also shape the uh, world of you and the understanding of future generations. Your view of the world is conditioned by what you have been taught to, to see. The basis for this Palestinian narrative that is being told is that Arabs and Muslims, they are terrorists, they are bad. Okay, we know that. Muslims, uh, that Islam is not terrorism, but still you have to uh, to say it explicitly in order to make things clear. There's always this suspicion. And this is also where the discussion needs to go. It's about how does democracy look for people of color in this country. What are the facts? Wait, do they even matter? I see your implicit bias is a heavy factor. I always hear you talk, but you listen never ever. That's a recipe for creating a new disaster. You rally up, up. Western civilization loved to claim its achievements as their own and its failures as the human. So they would say, oh, we the human, we're so destructive of life. I'm sorry, no. Human beings have been here for thousands of years and they have reproduced life in the planet without any problem. 
All the previous civilization with all the critics did not destroy life in the planet like this one. When they colonized Asia, uh, they mismanaged the whole uh, ecological system there and that costed 30 to 60 million deaths. And no other civilization in the history of the world has caused as much death and destruction as this one. And so this is not a problem of the human, this is a problem of a particular civilization. And it proclaimed to be universal. Hold up, hold up, there's an elephant in the room. Wanna tell you up front, but you dismiss what I'm saying. How can we talk when you silence the conversation? There's no way up with a downward domination. Let's get into it and check your privilege. You're playing clueless and I ain't having it. You're reproducing thoughts of a white supremacist. If you can handle something bad, then we're not in it together. What you need is a long-term process of decolonization. So decolonization is not an, abol an abolition or an event. Decolonization is a process. Colonialism has uh, uh, organized in, in different plantations. Each one has its own plantation. The blacks have their plantation, the Muslims have their plantation, Indians have their plantations. We recognize that governments, that other organizations would try to encourage us just to focus on our own group. In Divide and Rule, they have ensured that the blacks on the plantation don't communicate with the Indians on the other plantation or the Muslims on the other plantations. That's always happened. It always probably will continue to happen. We have to, to, to have conscience of that and we have to decide to become a political, political force in the North. But we have to make alliances between us. Those who are engaged in the work have to understand what are the uh, uh, ceiling of issues that we could agree on and also agree on those issues that we have to disagree on as part of the overall strategy. Underlying these differences, we have many common goals. Because here in, in, in France, we have the almost the same po political problem than uh, people of color in, in the Netherlands or in Great Britain, or in Germany, or in the US, or in Canada. And what the different communities of uh, color with each other verbind is, is uh, uh, the, the, the unity in the fight against what is bepaald is by another. There has to be a heavy focus in developing a broad-based unity on fundamental issues. How is the struggle against Black Pete related to the struggle against Zionism in Palestine, to the way the Americans are now uh, behaving in, in, in Latin America, uh, uh, the struggle uh, of the people of the Middle East uh, to find liberation. We have a great deal of shared humanity. We want to see our families do well. Uh, so if you want to fight colonialism, you have to unite the plantations. The most important is the the organization of people of color. The first the first step is here. It is important to have a collective voice and a political voice. We have to structure our own power. I think that the communities of color in Holland has made tremendous progress. They have made progress on two big fronts. One is the struggle against Black people. What happened a couple of years ago is that 
there were two artist activists who just wore a t-shirt during the national parade of, of the Sinterklaas festivity. And they had a t-shirt said Swarte Peter's racism and therefore they were brutally arrested. Just by wearing a t-shirt, it's not even that the police came, you know, came over, have a dialogue or, you know, it's a brute arrest. It's, it's connected to violence. Those images of their arrestment viral on social media and that mobilized a lot of people because that was also the moment people said enough is enough. <laughs> we need to, you know, come together. So I became part of the movement where Swarte Peter's symbol for institutional racism is a political voice to stand up against uh, inequality, discrimination, racism in the Netherlands. People came together at demonstration, manifestations. So think about 2011, it started with two people. In 2014, 60 people were arrested because 60 people thought this is not right. And you saw the movement growing because in 2015, over 100 people uh, joined the demonstration. In 2016, around 200 people got arrested for just wearing a t-shirt. In 2017, we decided to go again with buses towards the national parade to use our uh, democratic rights, our uh, freedom of speech, but also our right to demonstrate. However, we were blocked um, on the on the highway, the buses, by right-wing people. What surprised me is that nobody was ar arrested on that day, while there was a huge violation. So how come that people who just wear a t-shirt get brutally arrested and people who block a highway are not arrested? And it comes back to the question, how does democracy look like for people of color in the Netherlands? So take that moment where the highway was blocked just because of Schwarte Piet. Um, but if you can see now in a public debate what happened, it's not more if Schwarte Piet is racism or not, but it has developed into democracy. Now the issue is about free speech, the right to uh, freedom of association, basic political rights, ability to have the right to boycott, and I think those issues are winnable. The other is that the communities of color have been able to give political expressions to their aspiration through a political party like DENK, which is now in parliament uh, with three seats. DENK gives a stem to the people who it zal zijn om als tweede rangsburgers te worden behandeld in het land waar ze zijn geboren en getogen. Het was gewoon brood nodig dat er een nieuwe politieke beweging zou ontstaan. En ik zeg heel nadrukkelijk beweging, dus ook van onderop, die, die het gevoel en de emoties van mensen kanaliseert naar de plek waar het hoort. En dat is het parlement, dat is de Tweede Kamer. Dit is de plek waar het gebeurt. Er moet altijd, en dat is echt de rol die, die wij onszelf hebben aangemeten, er moet een steen in de vijver worden gegooid om ervoor te zorgen dat er beweging ontstaat. We hebben er toen echt heel bewust voor gekozen en daarmee zijn we echt de allereerste in Nederland. Hebben we stevig geïnvesteerd in onze social media kanalen. En eh, omdat we dat deden, we zichtbaar maakten wat er gebeurde hier in de Tweede Kamer, wat we overbrachten via sociale media naar de huiskamer, zijn gewoon de mobiele telefoons waardoor iedereen het kon zien. Er zijn heel veel mensen ons gaan volgen en op een gegeven moment kregen mensen dat in de gaten van hé, hey, wat gebeurt daar nou allemaal als je een bereik haalt van 2,5 miljoen mensen in Nederland? Dan staan mensen inderdaad te kijken en, en de journalisten hier te kijken van hé, hey, daar is iets aan het ontstaan. En dat is de rol die wij hebben op dit moment nog als een relatief kleine fractie, is dat we de blinde, de bewuste en de onbewuste blinde vlekken van de gevestigde politieke orde en de gevestigde media zichtbaar maken voor de buitenwereld. In social struggle, there's not one single tactic and even not one single strategy for success. The legal process that has been started uh, uh, by Jeffrey Pondach and his people against the Dutch state opened the door to tell the story which couldn't be told. So the Sakura Agade, where 431 people, where four children are executed, I actually begun. We hebben vier zaken voor. Het begint met Rauwe Gede, 2011. Dat de staat der Nederlanden uh, schuldig is, uh, is verklaard. En dat ze de schadevergoeding moeten betalen aan de, aan de wezen. En dat is gebeurd. En uh, toen we er klaar waren, zijn we toen meteen naar zuid sulawesi gegaan. Om met de weduwe van zuid sulawesi uh, te gaan spreken. En die zaken hebben we in 2013 gewonnen. 
En we hebben ook nog een Oost-Java een zaak gewonnen. Dat noem je de zaak de Pniwen affaire Daar is dus een, een, een Rode Kruis uh, ziekenhuisje, zeg maar, is aangevallen. En de mensen die daar werden behandeld, plus de broeders, die zijn geëxecuteerd. En dit jaar uh, meneer Jasman, die zeg maar gemarteld is. Dus we hebben vier, uh, vier zaken uh, gewonnen. Due to this legal process, we have now much more information about what went on. The whole discussion about reparations, that uh, the Dutch are against paying reparations uh, to the colonized people, but they, they were not against getting reparations uh, from the colonized people. And nobody talked about it. Now it's on the agenda. Different strategies will work in different places. In 2014, when the war in Gaza started, a lot of uh, organizations basically came to life. There were thousands, tens of thousands of people coming to demonstrations. There were a lot of organizations uh, then, like for example, uh, Youth for Palestine. Also, uh, another organization that uh, started was the Students for Justice in Palestine, which was actually inspired by the movement in the United States. What we do a lot is um, organizing demonstrations, but also trying to inform people, so lectures, for example, with um, important speakers. We talked with Tevu and we almost had an academic boycott um, of uh, you know, Israeli institutions. The strategy of the PDS, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanction, which is uh, the movement by Palestinian civil society, close to 700 different groups in Palestine that called for a solidarity movement. The BDS movement is an important movement uh, to bring down uh, the, the state of Israel. That's basically the non-violent way basically to uh, demand your rights. The work that we are doing in terms of Palestine um, through Hood's Day, that's one of the things that we have been, we are responsible for uh, managing it and running the event. Islamic Human Rights Commission is an organization that has been fighting for the rights of the oppressed. The Hood's Day, just to give a bit of history, it's 38 years old and this country has been running for about 30 years. Remembering Palestine and making sure that the oppression in Palestine um, is not something that is forgotten. It's a proactive march in support of the Palestinians. We have a lot of reactive marches when things happen, but this is set in the calendar. And it's always been a kind of family-friendly event, and for the last 15, 20 years, it's been really diverse. We've had people from many different backgrounds actually coming to the event, taking part in the event, supporting the event, and we've had people from Jewish background, from Christian backgrounds, um, from people of faith, of no faith, actually coming to speak uh, about Palestine on, uh, on that platform. It's a matter of collective social mobilization, collective organization. I belong to a party, which is Le Parti des Indigènes de la République, the party of the indigenous of the Republic. We are a decolonial party. When we are opposing a specific oppression, we are not just making a statement, not just saying I'm against racism, but we are thinking strategically. The March of Dignity, the first one, was led by women of color. And it was important for us because we had to, we had to deliver a message. In the center of Paris, so you c couldn't ignore them. So I think some Parisian had never saw that much black and Arabs in the middle of, uh, of, of Paris. And it was a way to say, we know which is our main enemy. And we are marching to say, stop to police crimes. Our brothers are victims of police crimes. And we don't agree with that. We don't agree with that. What are you gonna do? Point five.
er is een taart die, die verdeeld moet worden. En van oudsher zijn er een aantal gevestigde politieke partijen die uh, aanspraak maken op een deel van de taart. En in die zin is een nieuwkomer is altijd vervelend, want die zegt van hé, hey, wacht eens even, die taart, eh, ik heb vanuit mijn burgerschap heb ik recht op een stuk van die taart. Dus mij ga je niet meer afzetten met een aantal kruimels, daar neem ik geen genoegen mee. Ik eis mijn deel van die taart op. Nou, dan is het natuurlijk van, hé, hey, maar uh, dat, dat gaat ten koste van mijn stukje taart en daar ontstaan confrontaties door. In essence, social struggle is about confrontation. Uh, it is difficult to grasp, but we should also be prepared to this. They try to intimidate people who, who have the, the courage to support us. A lot of times when I try to speak about this topic, I immediately um, got attacked, um, not because of what I said, but because of who I was. So I was personally attacked, not on the issue itself. Organized attacks coming from the political and the journalistic sphere. Turning the criminal into the victim and the victim into the criminal. For example, in the Black Pete movement, the protesters against Black Pete are criminalized, as, are being framed as terrorists. And the people who block uh, 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 civil rights, uh, who organize uh, uh, gangs that throw eggs and, and, and uh, intimidate and terrorize people, are seen as the defenders of Dutch cultures. In the Palestinian struggle, the Zionists are seen as the victim while they occupy Palestine land and the Palestinians are seen as terrorists. That Indonesia's uh, uh, extremists and, uh, uh, and terrorists are there, that's all in the book. There is the weapon that kills, but then there is the pen that kills many times over. The way they behave is very easy. They just accuse us of being anti-Semite. And staatsgevaarlijk, etc. Homophobic and sexist anti-white racist. But on a larger scale, that is what has been done all around the world. Whenever there was a liberation struggle, Mandela was called a terrorist, you know? And the terrorists were called the defenders of Western values. Then you have the age-old repression. And how they do it, they do it in public to make everybody know that if you, if you stand up, this will happen to you and it's, it's going to be a punishment. This has also happened in slavery. The moment that somebody shows resistance, it's a huge backlash. And uh, we have seen it in the, in the struggle against uh, the character of blackface, uh, where you get into a peaceful protest and you being arrested. So in certain areas, it might be arresting people and putting them in jail is the way to uh, pursue the silencing. In other places, it might be uh, uh, supporting and uh, uh, creating what alternative voices. So whenever there's a struggle uh, of communities of color, suddenly you see from that community of color, people standing up defending the colorizer uh, and defending their ideas and uh, creating understanding and uh, criminalizing the people who stood up. Ja, die, die voorbeelden die worden ook met name gebruikt door de elite, de gevestigde politieke orde, om te zeggen van kijk, het kan wel. Nee, maar het zijn precies die figuren die ze eruit hebben gehaald en hebben gekozen en daar hebben neergezet. As you see, we saw that Khan in City Hall, who's kind of transformed himself from being a civil rights lawyer into someone who's now trying to ban pro-Palestinian marches on the streets of London. Het is altijd al zo gegaan, hè? De, ook de generaties voor ons. En dan zijn er altijd mensen binnen die gemeenschap die een stukje status kregen, een stukje aanzien kregen. Uh, of mensen die geld kregen, een subsidie krijgen. So follow the money and you will see uh, who is pulling the strings. Like a bad guy to put you on
on the defense I'll make you apologize Three, turn a simple matter into complex I got four, five, six Check my bed for electrics And I say ha, 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 ha Keep that power in my pocket Ha, 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 ha. Ain't giving up my seat now Ha, 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 ha Challenge me and you will suffer Ha, ha The most effective way in suppressing a struggle is by divide and rule. En helaas, helaas, dat is, dat is misschien ook wel een van de dingen waar ik soms wel eens moedeloos van word. Het is zo makkelijk om ons te verdelen. Whenever uh, people of different communities come together, suddenly you get the narratives that creates hate and tension of one community against the other. This is how uh, colonialism and the white power structure has worked to impose its will on people. Now, now, now I see you and I see them and y'all might whip me if you're friends so I'll give you a little more. Make your chief in command but I'm the boss, I'm the one you want to please, I'm the one who knows better, treat them like your enemies. What? to keep going make you do my dirty work keep my kingdom growing what yeah it's a no move but it's still a goal move y'all still play along and i keep on winning i say ha 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 keep that power in my pocket ha 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 ain't giving up my seat now People need to remember that this is how um, you know, oppressors work because one of the things that they are trying to do uh, to us is to create so much pressure on us that we will say, is it really worth the hassle? Is it worth the fight? Should we perhaps express it in different ways? But we have to fight because we, if, if we don't do anything, they are free to do whatever they want. But if we resist, they have to react to our resistance. And the clash is also well nodig, and that is voornamelijk nodig om bewustzijn te creëren over de vraag van wat zijn wij eigenlijk voor land? Wie zijn wij met z'n allen? And I'm not suggesting this will be easy. It's never been easy. But this for me is the way to move forward. I think it is important that non-white people know that they are not alone, even if they are not in, in a party or in a, in, in a movement. It seems like we didn't win the battle, but I know we already won the war. We might have lost the battle, but I know the war is not over. scars but I know it's part of being a soldier Ah
rather than dwell on the defeat. I actually think it's important to celebrate every victory, however small, because it becomes a fuel that allows us to keep going for those moments when we do have defeat. It's a stick that my mood gives. The kleine stapjes vooruit, die, die zichtbare verandering. And ons doel is, is so zuiver. Uh, wij, wij, wij verdienen helemaal niks. Wij, wij, we hebben een gewone rechtvaardigheid. Wat kies mijn drive is de concept van vrijheid en hoe het looks like. I always look at the Palestinians and you know when I see what they endure and what they go through and all the struggles they have to face every day, every single day, they can't get a break. I can get a break sometimes. They are holding this struggle now for so long, for generations now. If they aren't giving up, how can you say um, you know that that you can't do anything? Our biggest strength is within. If we have the spiritual fortitude then there's no way you can be defeated. And they wanna frame us as villains But I know that history will redeem us And they try to break our spirit and soul But I know they'll never succeed to defeat When you get involved in social struggle, it's not a happy journey. It's not, oh, how great, we are have a good time. When you get in, in, involved in social struggle, your primary motive is humanity and love. Revolutionary love is the love of ourselves. Because people of color are hurt. They don't like themselves. They are, they can be ashamed of themselves because they think that they are backward. They can think that because um, they were, they lost their humanity in the past and they, they are still reconquering their humanity. So the first thing is to, is to, to be able to lo love ourselves. This is the first step, to have confidence in ourselves, to believe in ourselves. And the second step is to be able not to hate our enemies. Because I think that if we begin to hate, is a way of becoming like our enemies. So if we don't want to hate, we, we have to love. But this is revolutionary because it's not so easy to love our enemies. You're fighting out of love from your people, your community, love for justice, love for humanity. So if you get involved because of that motive, you should realize that when you fight with love, you fight hate. So don't get overwhelmed that you encounter hate, that you encounter repression. What does it mean? We fight against racism, but we don't see white people as enemies. Although you are militant in your struggle against racism, you still treat a white person as a human being and understand how humans, humans have been deformed by the institution of color and ethnicity. It means that there is a liberty in, inside them. They can choose not to stay white. And actually, it's not so difficult to choose not to stay white. It means that we have to choose the, 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 the good political fight to become decolonial. We have to think in terms of um, 
a long history. You resist a civilization of death which has been instituted for 500 years. If it's 500 years that have brought us here, it's not going to be, you know, one more conference away from revolution. Short term, long term, we're thinking 5 and 20 years. And I always say that for me, the short term is 50, the long term is two, 300 minimum. So if that is the nature of your struggle, you should be in for a struggle for the next 500 years. We have to have a longer sense of both history and, and of the future as well. Anyone that is engaged in any type of resistance and uh, movement, their primary concern should be how to develop and uh, make sure that the next generation is trained. And we think that the uniqueness quote of a particular leader or particular organizer is what made the movement successful rather than to think about the structures that could reproduce over a prolonged period of time. So any leader that is not thinking about whom the person they're gonna bring forth over a period of time, they're not really taking their leadership uh, seriously in this sense. And I think a focus should be done on that part of how to train individuals, uh, next generation and empower them for me, there's no such thing as a pliant or uh, uninformed. There's just people who have not been trained to do so. So if you're not informed, that doesn't mean you will never get informed. It's a question of dignity. Because we have people in front of us who really, really, really do not respect us. And we can't let them uh, behave, behaving like that because one of the things that the establishment wants us to do is to self-censor. And if you self-censor, what is the difference between um, you know, them asking you to do it or you doing it yourself? Because in both cases, what you've achieved is what the oppressor wanted you to achieve. So you might as well go down fighting. People victims of racism or of colonialism always organize uh, themselves. We have a, a great historical example, which is the, the liberation of Haiti, the liberation of, of Vietnam, the liberation of Algeria. We fight for ourselves. Right, so there's a spirit of resistance and that, that's, that is really our greatest strength. And I would argue that even though we face discrimination, racism, injustice right now, it would be far worse if black people hadn't mobilized in the past and if black women and men were not mobilizing at the present time. Social struggle is effective. We have come a long way in the liberation movement. There's a lot of things that have been achieved, but it has been achieved at a cost. There have been sacrifices made by people who didn't become ministers or senior academics or whatever or whatever. That were conscious decisions. They decided to, to fight the narrative and to make sacrifices. And I think that's something that we forget. And we have to learn what people gave up and you know exactly how radical they had to be for us to even have a little something. There are so many interesting and inspiring figures that motivate me every time because they fought against a power that was so big, yet they still managed to uh, fight them without fear. So many people, so many people, so many heroes, 
so many. And they just wanted to be liberated and they just wanted to liberate their people. Mijn voorbeeldfunctie is gewoon onze eerste president Boncarno. Zonder hem zijn wij niet 73 jaar nu, afgelopen 17 augustus, onafhankelijk van de kolonisator Nederland. Dit is mijn Boncarno. In de history of the people of Suriname, we have a young woman, her name is Jani Tittery, who led a courageous revolt against the colonizer in 1884 and was shot dead uh, from one meter from behind. Uh, Hajari Abdel Kader, she's really not known, I think, um, even in France, but she is, she was the original founder of the North African Star. So one really important, uh, one of the first Algerian nationalist anti-colonial uh, uh, movement. Malama Zina in Nigeria. I would say she is a leader of the Islamic movement in Nigeria. She's currently in prison. As a teenager, I was fortunate to come across books by Angela Davis and eventually by people like Bell Hooks and June Jordan that showed me black people were intellectuals, we're academics, we're scholars. Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, he is a historical figure and he liberated Palestine and Jerusalem from the Crusaders. Subhash Chandra Bose, founder of the Indian Army, a great figure who organized his people uh, to fight British uh, imperialism and British colonialism. I think Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Of course, Malcolm X. There's no way around that. I find where he started from to where he got to an amazing journey. A big, big uh, inspiration of mine to, um, you know, embrace yourself, to love yourself. Malcolm has articulated decolonizing the minds in a magnificent way. I think it's a combination of uh, Malcolm X aan de ene kant en uh, Martin Luther King aan de andere kant. De strijd kan je voeren door uh, een iedere rol te geven in, in, in deze strijd. En wat de kracht van de combinatie Malcolm X en Martin Luther King is, is dat Malcolm X die strijd aanging en dat deed op een felle manier. Uh, en, en Martin Luther King het eigenlijk wist te verzilveren door sympathie te winnen voor, voor het verhaal. Het is een collectivity. I was always inspired by them. I think that uh, having those stories in our lives, celebrating those stories, uh, makes you proud. We need those remembrance, we need these names as part of building our power uh, uh, and building the empowerment of our community. In the name of history, in the name of the past, in the name of those who fought for us, who died for us, Irrespective of whether one lives to see the revolution, so to speak, the work must carry on. After 500 years, it is possible to have a world that deals with the legacy of colonialism in a final way. Concepts and ideas that are, are being developed by many movements around the world. The Muslim civilization, the Hindu civilization, the indigenous people, the African civilization have produced concepts, Dharma, Ubuntu, uh, uh, Pachamama, all kinds of ideas have been there, which we can draw to build this idea of a new civilization as a diverse civilization. So how would this new world civilization look like? We will move from a world society based on universalism 
and one idea, one, one, one science to a world based on pluriversity and diversity. We want a world in which many worlds fit. The US people in the Americas talk about plurinational states. States that are not anymore nation states. States that recognize that there are many nations living inside one state. It speaks to what they would say is the civilization of death that seeks to destroy everything and make everything into you know, a monoculture, right? In the, in the image of the West. There's a phrase that, go, that says something along the lines of um, walking we ask questions. By saying walking we ask questions is to suggest that it's in the struggle itself that new questions will emerge that we have yet to foreseen. And so we can't make an illusion about a pre-established destination. Now, do we ourselves have the humility and the capacity for self-reflection to recognize those new questions as they emerge? Well, whatever one might do to even generations of people who are, have faced colonization, you know, the, there's still a core that remains that will, that will be undefeated. Kwahetuma couldn't imagine that his defeat would lead to the transatlantic enslavement, to the colonization of Africa and Asia, to a whole world that was ruled by a civilization of death. He couldn't imagine the facts but he could imagine the idea. He says a period of darkness has come, but one thing we know for sure is that that sun will rise again and that a day will come when our teachings can be brought back to the people. And we are now in an era where the Western Enlightenment is going down and the sun of the colonized people will rise again. And in this sense, zijn tijden aan het veranderen. Mensen laten zich niet meer klein houden. Mensen laten zich niet meer kort houden. Mensen hebben een wil. I'm actually really proud of my generation. Um, I'm 29. Um, I'm part of this movement. And I am inspired by that resistance because we do not have the resources that the nations of Europe have to perpetrate their uh, condescension, colonial education against us, and yet we don't give up. And it is for that reason that you have uh, you know, a broader, wider Europe that is freaking out, if you will. Because in the 500 years of resistance, we have created new knowledge, new structures, and we are now in an era where the decolonial movement is gaining ground across the globe. I see now a bigger literature, a more critical literature that gives people opportunities to explore and figure out the truth for themselves rather than just swallowing the western narrative uncritically. And in this sense think that we to make have with a generation of people who very good know where they are bezig zijn, die een doel voor ogen hebben, die weet hoe het werkt, die weet hoe ze het moeten aanpakken. We see the rise of the rest and the fall of the west. That is what's happening now. So we are at the end game of colonialism. And that's important to realize because we have a bright future. So we keep saying we are here because you were there and we will remain here forever.